was heavy. Right, what are we looking at? We're looking at an electric transport moped. Yeah. Anyone who's Scandinavian is probably going to be familiar with these, or definitely going to be familiar with these things. Now, I know that if I turned up in England on one of these, people would laugh at me. And then they'd ask questions like, is your balance so bad that you can't ride an ordinary motorcycle? <laughs> but we're not in England, and in the Great Frozen North, this is an accepted way of moving yourself and moving things. And they've, they've been around for a lot of, lot of years. Um, most of them have a, a petrol engine. This is a little bit different. This has an electric engine and batteries. It's a 24 volt system. I don't really know anything about the, the actual motor in it because it's never given me any trouble. So I've never, I've never got into it, but I'll try and find a little bit of information about it and drop in here somewhere. It's made by Transport Eel, which I believe is a company out of Vesteros. Vesteros, I think the rest of the world might know, because Ryanair very optimistically call Vesteros Stockholm Vesteros. And you think that you're going to fly in there and you're going to end up in Stockholm. You're not. If you fly into Stockholm Vesteros, you're going to end up in Vesteros. It's a long way from Stockholm. Um, yeah, so I had this, a, I think I've had this a year, year and a half now. It's been great just for trundling around the village. There are a few things I want to do with it. I want to paint it because it looks a bit sorry. But I wanted to paint it under the winter and it was too cold. And I wanted to paint it last summer, but then I was using it. So you know how that one goes. But whether or not I managed to paint it now, that's a cat making a noise. Whether or not I managed to, managed to paint it now, um, there are a few things which I need to address. There's a little bit of electrical work that needs to be done. There are too many things that are attached before the main fuse, for my liking. In my world, there shouldn't be anything attached before the main fuse. But this is owned by a farmer. Um, so, yeah. There are some unusual repairs that, that have been done. On Cat, can do artist. Thank The main thing that I need to fix now is the rear fender. And I'll take you over there and show you what I'm talking about. So this is not attached at the moment, and it's not attached because I've taken it off. Quite logically. If you see, the tyre rubs on the inside, and it's, it's actually rubbed a hole in it. And I think someone's bashed this sort of, whatever that is, in the top of the fender to try to get it to clear the back tyre. The back tyre is not original, this is from just an ordinary moped. So if you if you see pictures of it, actually, the, the chain is very, very close to rubbing on the tyre as well, so this is not, this is not the correct tyre. It's got a, a larger diameter than the original tyre, and that gives a little bit more top speed. It's got a top speed of maybe, oh, I don't know, 25 kilometres an hour. It's basically, it's an industrial machine, so it's designed to buzz around in a factory somewhere on concrete floors. Uh, it doesn't have much in the way of suspension or anything like that. Cat, Batist, I for sure you had a video here. So it's, it, it works fine on these gravel roads that we have around here, surprisingly. Um, but yeah, so someone's, someone's changed the back tyre, obviously, probably because the back tyre was worn out and they put this one on and it's probably the only one that they could get and it's a little bit bigger. So I need to make the fender sit higher up and it has got, it's got nuts that are just sitting here on the frame where it bolts down and that's to make it a little bit higher. This actually worked fine until I inflated the rear tyre, and then it, it didn't just grow at the bottom, it, I don't know, it grew all the way around. Um, but the main reason I can't get the fender up is that 
as a cat in a way, is that someone's welded on these little strengthening pieces here. These are not original, and these get in the way of the fender. And I think they've done that to strengthen this because they've... I don't know what they've done. They've either run into something, or they've tried towing something in reverse and it's bent it. I, I really don't know. This is not original either. I don't know. I've towed an empty boat trailer with this. And that, that worked fine, but I mean, you, you, you can't really tow any real weight with it. Um, so I think order of business is cut these things off because they're not doing anything. Maybe try and straighten this out at the same time because it is quite bent. And then we should be able to get the rear fender up a little bit and it should be able to drive it anyway, even if I don't get it painted there. So possibly maybe, yeah, 13 millimeter. on the back. Oh, there's a nut on the back. I thought there was something captive in there. there is. There's not a lot of space in there, I'll tell you that much. whole thing is quite rusty. Yeah, that's some paint falling off. It's not terminal rust, it just looks a bit sad. <laughs> There's some tension on that. That's because everything's bent and welded up. And that's, yeah, more paint. Right, that's that tow bar thing out of the way. This isn't on all of them. I don't... It might even not be original, I don't know. I've, I've never seen another one, but I've seen pictures of them. And I, I'm yet to see a picture of one with this thing on it. But I think it's quite useful to have. I mean, you can't really, you can't really tow much with it, but a lot of the times it's good to have a tow bar, so if you run into something, or something runs into you, you it doesn't do any damage. I mean, look at this thing, it has been quite extensively modified. This is not... It's sort of bend here. That hasn't always been there. I can do that much. So on this side it sits on the, what's that, sway arm maybe, that's what the, what the wheel sits in here in any case, and it's got little nuts here as a oh, spacer, and that's been, that's been welded by somebody with a stick welder and a stainless steel rod, so yeah, that's a farmer. <laughs> guarantee you that. Um, so we, I think we can just put a, a little bit bigger spacer in there. And when I say a little bit bigger spacer I mean two nuts instead of one nut. One day I'll get round to making a new fender. So on this side, oi, on this side there were three holes, there's no one hole left, no one and a half holes, and that attaches in these, yeah, probably not that hole, probably those three holes here. So this side's a little bit more involved. I was sort of planning on just putting a plate here, but there's not a lot to attach to. You know, sort of an extension plate, 
Um, I'd like to still do that, but I guess it's holding on with one, one and a half as it is now. I guess it'll con continue to hold on with one and a half. Yeah. So maybe I'm going to start by work out where the fender needs to be. So I've got a piece of one by something here. Put that on top of the tyre and rest the fender on there. And then we know that we've got an inch of clearance. This fender moves up and down with the suspension, what little sus suspension there is. So that clearance is always going to be there. And then you see we've got quite a lot of, quite a big gap there. It's going to bolt down here. What have we got? We've got yeah, 30 mil, 30 millimetres. So longer bolts, that's no problem. And 30 millimetres worth of spacer. See what we can come up with. So bolts, I believe we want M6 over here. And then, let's see, we want 30 plus the thickness of the steel and the fender and a little bit, a little bit more. So we've got some threads going in. So that'll do. Um, one of that, that's got a weird head on it. What hex head, really. Not that. Just do one of those. That's you know, 40, that'll do. That's stainless, and the other one's not, but what are you going to do? Um, hmm. Got some stainless hardware somewhere as well, which is here. in here. Yeah, that's 35. Yeah, maybe. That would be better. That's probably 40. So, I, I, I appear to have three 35s anyway in stainless. Let's start with that, see if that's enough. It turns out that five M8 nuts are more or less 30 millimeter. So that will give us our spacer. Um, is it redneck? Yes. Will it work? Yes. Will I do something better later? Yeah, probably. Okay, that's where we want to be on this side. Let's go look at the other side. So on this side, we need to make this we need to make this whole fender level first. Little spirit level up there. I thought this was aluminium, it's not. It's actually steel. So theoretically, it should be. 30 millimetres here as well. Go from hole centre to hole centre. Are we level? No. <laughs> it's 25. Okay. Yeah. Someone's been here before. This is only temporary. Don't worry. I will be doing something better. What I'd like to do is just remake this whole rear fender because it's a, it's a very easy shape to make. It's just straight lines and flat bits of metal and two bends in the whole thing. Little bits of stainless steel. I've got a good collection of these. I use them as shims. But we can use this one here. So I think screw that on the frame here, or on the sway arm here. 
and then bolt the fender to that. I think we'll be where we want to be. This hole doesn't even line up, and it doesn't line up because I assumed that all of the holes were in a straight line, and they weren't. They did one of these. Um, yeah, don't assume. But this is just a temporary measure to, to, to make this thing drivable. It wasn't really drivable before. Not with the, the wheel rubbing and the fender. Yeah, so let's cut those aftermarket reinforcement bits off the off the tow bar the tow hitch or whatever it is and put that back on Let's try whacking out with a big hammer, see if we can make that a little bit straighter. I'm thinking the only way to get this straight is to cut the shackle off, get this hitch off, straighten it and then weld this back on. And I fully intend to do that, but not right now. Right then, so that's the immediate drivability problem solved. Um, as I said before, this will have to be remade. It's, it's been modified, probably with a big hammer. It's got superfluous holes all over the place. It's bent, it's buckled, it's, yeah, it is how it is. But it works, for now. Wondering if it's going to catch here. I think it probably is. And that, that's mostly because this is bent. And this frame appears to be different lengths on, <laughs> on both sides as well. So I think this thing might very well be homemade. There 
go. Solve the clearance issues. I'll be looking closer at these bits that I cut off and I worked out what they are. <laughs> the pieces of a horseshoe. I did mention I bought this from a farmer, right? I think the next thing then is to start looking at the bits of the electrical system that I want to do something about. Um, I've done a few things to it already. I added a main shutoff switch here because there wasn't one before. Um, it's only 24 volts but there's you know, quite a lot of amps so I don't know why there wasn't one. I feel a lot happier having one. That's just sitting on a little piece of stainless steel plate. And then on the other side I added a charging input. This is a Speakon connector um, with a Speakon little flappy keep the weather out thing. When I got this it had an inbuilt charger and the inbuilt charger was dead and I looked at replacing that and yeah <laughs> they're not cheap. So I now use an external charger and that's lying over here. So I now use this which cost me I think about 150 euro which is a lot cheaper than the other one would have been. This one obviously is not weatherproof, so this can't be fixed to the machine. It has to live somewhere dry, and then when you want to charge it, you just plug it in. So the disadvantage with that is that before, you could turn up anywhere that had normal 220 volt power outlet and charge your moped, but I can't do that anymore. But it's never been a problem. And that's the other, the other end of that thing. These are pretty well made. Um, they're sort of weatherproof and they're, they're designed for high-end stereo equipment. So they're for DC power. This is a 24 volt charger. Uh, designed for D DC power. And um, yeah, I could have used a normal power outlet, but there's always a risk if you do that, that someone's going to come along and plug in 220 volts to it and that would be quite spectacular. So I wanted to find something that couldn't be muddled up. The first thing I want to do is if we turn on that there and we turn on the key this is the charge indicator. Now when I got this the charge indicator wasn't working. I managed to find a wiring diagram and get it to work, wire it in properly. Um, not much was working when I got this, so that's fixed now. But it's showing three bars from fully charged. As far as I know, it should be fully charged, because I charged it the other day. I've had this problem before. It gets a poor connection on the back of the connector to the charging indicator, the charge indicator. So I'm going to see if that's the case, and if that is the case, I'm going to solder them. Um, and that should be the end of that problem. I'm going to connect the battery, not just turn off the, the main switch, I'm going to connect, disconnect the battery because the charging indicator is directly connected to the battery as it's supposed to be according to the people who make the charging indicator. Few of the batteries under the under the load bed, and there's a, a quick disconnect here. And looking at there's something I did this last year. I can't remember what's what. There's something on a fusible link, and yeah, that's that's got to be the charging in indicator or the charge indicator, and that's good. I was wondering if there was a fusible link on there. If there wasn't, I needed to put one on, but apparently there already is one. This is probably not so good. I think I'll solder that join as well, because that can also cause a problem. I 
don't remember these wires being quite so tight. Apparently they are. Yeah. Hmm. This thing is a fiberglass pen, and it's great for cleaning small terminals. I don't have anything for cleaning the insides of these. Where did that come from? That came from there. I think. Yeah. Oh, that one doesn't look good. Alright, let's turn the power back on and see if we get any, any difference there. the same as it is. The same as it is. The same as it was. Hmm. Maybe it just isn't fully charged. I am going to go ahead and solder those because I've had problems with that before. So if I've had problems with it before I think it's only a matter of time before I have problems with it again. I think that's a logical conclusion to draw. This is my electrical cabinet here under the bench. So here we have multimeter and all sorts of wire strippers and solder and crimpers and screwdrivers and everything like that. And here we have a lot of plugs and sockets and cable clips and everything like that there. And then we go down to drawer number three and we have uh, scotch locks and terminal connectors and diverse stuff, light bulbs and and then here, I appear to have a little box here that's completely full of sunflower seeds. Um, and some terminal blocks at the bottom. So, uh, yeah. I don't think I put those there. I think I might have a mouse. And you do nothing to help. Go catch some mice. Right then, as I suspected, the batteries are indeed fully charged. And now we have the charge meter showing fully charged. So that was all just down to bad connections between the battery and the charge meter. I do need to get some dielectric grease um, instead of this, I think that's copper grease. Oh, it is copper grease on the battery terminals. So I need to try and remember to pick up some dielectric grease. But now it's soldered all the way from the fuse holder down there, right way up here. And that appears to have done the trick. A few days have passed and I need to get this thing out of here. This turned up. This is a planer. Lovely bit of kit. That turned up. That's a table saw. That's also nice. There's a lawnmower sitting there, I don't know why. There's a huge beehive sitting here, and that's just taking up too much space. But I need to get this out of the workshop. So I think um, I will continue on with the electrical issues, but that's going to be a little bit... Oh, I can do that outside. What I really need to do now is take a little bit of this apart, get it outside, wire wheel all the rust off it, paint it and then it can stay outside again. I have to bring it in to paint it but I can get it out of here. Let's do that.
think that's the third time I've had it on its side. But this is the first time I've had it on its side intentionally. I'll try and get these fenders off. There is a screw there. Oh, I've no idea what that is because it's full of everything. There's a screw there and a screw there. There should be a screw in there, but it's gone. That's why this one's a bit flappy. So under this dust cap, there is something. I can't really remember. I think there's a, a locking ring. A circlet, I think. Yes, there is. So that's the only thing holding the wheel on. Seems to work, it hasn't fallen off yet. What was the first time? I'll try and see what sort of screws these are. They look like Torx, but I don't know, nothing else on the machine is Torx. Or is it Hex? Yeah. That looks like a Torx. That's something else. Don't know. Uh, there's another one here. I'm not holding out a lot of hope for these actually coming out. They've been here a long time. That's a, I don't know, that's something. Not that. Are you... no? Are you hex? No? Not that hex size in any case. Yeah! I'd go with it being a... What's that? T Shugi? T20. Torx 20 in English. Thing. Is it going to come out? Can I even get the? Mm. Can I even get the drill in there? Oh! Ow! I can get it in there, but I can't hold on to it. And that's here. Yeah. Okay, it's rusted off on the backside, so it's not doing anything anyway. Let's not bother about that. Let's try and get this one out. <coughs> not like that, do I? This is what I should have done in the first place. It's a... Yeah, it's definitely a Torx. Twenty-five, maybe? Yes, no, yeah, ow. Huh. It came out. I was not expecting that. Uh, yeah. Successful. Try again. <laughs> that also came out. This is the wrong tool. I need a. There we go. Did work. <sighs> Yeah. So the screw didn't just pull out, it, um, yeah, that's a big rusty hole. So, should probably fix that. This is the brake drum, which is welded onto the wheel on the inside. Yeah, that works. Well, I got this machine, it didn't have any brakes at all while well, they were there, but they didn't work. Everything was rusted solid. So the first thing I did, was I live on a big slope here, you know, live on a halfway up a hill. The first thing I did was get the brakes working. And it turned out you don't really need brakes, 
because you've got a massive amount. I'll leave that off because I'm going to have to take the wheel off again. You've got a massive amount of engine braking for the motor. So, yeah. It's nice to have brakes. It's nice to have a parking brake because you can park it on a slope. No big rusty holes here. Um, no small rusty holes either. So that's nice. A lot of rust. A lot of rust. That. Hmm. I get my not a bodywork hammer. And see if I can find any holes. Screw obviously broke off. Well, it's not new, but there are no holes in it. That'll do. And the only other eventful things that happened is uh, I broke the end off my pick trying to clean the mud out of the screw, so whatever mud that is, it's obviously stronger than this. <laughs> Strange. I'm going to do that for at least a couple of hours and see where we get. Well, I found this and that's a big crack. This part of the subframe has been replaced. This bit's been replaced because this is stainless steel and this has been farmer welded here with you know, with a stick welder. So I wasn't going to take the subframe off now, but I really need to take this off and take it up to the workshop and weld this and probably replace some bit, strengthen it in, in any case. This isn't re really square. Um, the whole thing tracks to one side and I could just adjust that, but you know, this is obviously the reason why it tracks to one side. So I think it's probably, I wasn't, really wasn't planning on doing this right now, but I think it's time to take this off, take it up to Seymour's workshop and weld it up properly. Hmm. This is the problem with painting stuff, you just, yeah, never ends. There are a few things that need to be disconnected to get the front subframe off. And I think we'll start with brakes. Um, I have got some tools, to, this is basically a ball joint. I've got ball joint splitters, but yeah, they're way too big. I wonder if we, instead of destroying that, and that's currently working, we just take this nut off. Um, it's cheating, but yeah, it's a good kind of cheating. There we go. Eight millimeter on the back. And then that goes through there. So I think we'll just wind the end off. I'll have to adjust these up again later, but that's not a problem. Put that out of there, and let's oh, 
wrap around a weight. We've got these big rubber bushes, and that's what that's no, that's the suspension. Such that it is. It doesn't really matter which side we get off, but we've got to get one side off. Oh. All right, that was easy. That one's coming. That's good. Not the easiest thing to get to. I will say that much. The threads at the end are a little bit rusty. Kind of an understatement. There we go. And then at the other side, this carpet's just covering up the electrical bits on the other side so I didn't get it full of dust. On the other side we've got this big through bolt and probably in a bushing. Oh, so we can get a socket on this. Still turning. Jam that in there. That sounds good. And the other side. Oh dear. This nut didn't put up any struggle at all, but it hits the, it hits this thing, which is where the it's just a sort of a clamp for the brake cables to run through. So I can't knock it up. I can't get the bolt out. So I need to see. I think if I can get this bolt just to oh it doesn't even really want to turn. It's probably rusted into the bushing. I didn't want to put a lot of oil on this because I'm, you know, the only thing I'm trying to do is paint it, but yeah, we saw how, saw how that one went. But if I can get this bolt to come up without hitting it from the back side, because I can't hit it from the back side, that would be ideal. Well, it's the only option I've got. But at the moment, nothing's going under the head of the bolt. You can be certain of that. Stuck in the rubber bushing. 
so what to do I can cut the end of the bolt off but yeah that doesn't help um, see what that is there is that rubber yeah that's rubber so I think that bolt and it's <laughs> it's not an ordinary bolt either it's a the whole thing's a bushing so that's going to be a problem on the other side I have to get a new one um, yeah what are we going to do about that maybe cut it off here and cut the head off I mean the bushing's shot so it's not the end of the world but then I have to order parts but I've got to order parts for the other side anyway so yeah let's think about that one I'm not getting anywhere with gentle persuasion so time to cut this off It still won't go, I can't knock it up, which is what I need to do. Knock it down a little bit. I can probably cut it again. So it's going to sit in the, in the front subframe, or in the subframe. And I can get it out. Um, it appears to have quite a lot of tension on it, because the whole thing's lying on its side. So that, can, that might be interesting put in a cutting disc in that. Before I take it out completely I want to measure everything because it's not square at the front. This is bushing which is a suspension this is kicked over this way and that's because someone's just <laughs> tried to weld everything together. The whole thing is also not square but that's, that's a lot easier to fix. But I need to take some measurements, so I need to get a measurement straight down here, and that's going to tell me. It's basically going to tell me the distance from this point to the bottom of the of the suspension bushing, and then I can just make everything else square with that. I think, I hope. Yeah, that's a plan. Trying to work out what's going on here. I thought this was stainless steel, but it's not got a magnet here and it sticks to it. This is stainless steel and the magnet doesn't stick so this is ferrous. This is steel and it this has got to be original and that really begs the question why is this bushing not lining up? I was sort of thinking that this whole piece here had been replaced. I think it I don't know if it's just the angle this way that's wrong, but something isn't quite right about this. What's not quite right? I'm not sure at the moment. It might actually, it might be okay. Yeah, I think we're going to say it's okay. This obviously was never precision engineered, <laughs> and it's certainly not precision engineered now. But before I cut this bushing bolt out, I need to get the tension off it. I could probably just kick the whole thing up like that. If it's got tension on it, it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna clamp down on the cutting disc when I go through, and um, yeah, that can be exciting. 
got the tension off that, so I think, yeah, let's cut that out. That's loose. I really did think that this would be the easiest place to get the steering linkages apart. Um, <laughs> I stand corrected. The bolt that went through got that out after a bit of a struggle, but yeah, the rest of it's in there. I mean, really in there. I think the other big advantage of this is if I can get this apart, I can get the handlebars off and then it's going to be, you know, I can flip it upside down. Every time I turn this thing over, I'm getting further and further into the blueberry bush there. So, I hope I get this done soon before I end up completely in the middle of it. Well, that was a lot easier. This is the bolt that broke off. Looks like it might actually be a fairly ordinary bushing. If I can get, yeah, I can get these bolts. That's not a problem. That's an ordinary shoulder bolt. Um, yeah. I might not have, there are still parts available for these machines, but I might be able to just get an ordinary generic bushing which will be, I think, easier, cheaper and quicker. Then there are a few electrical connections. There's the horn and the headlight. And they're cable tied to the, the subframe. The wires are cable tied to the subframe here. None of this is original. The horn we can just unclip. And the, oh, there's another cable tie. And this headlamp, yeah, I think we'll just unbolt that. Just unbolt the whole unit here. It does go through. Yeah, good. Well, that's loose. I 
thinking, stick a couple of axle stands under the front here, and then something like that. And just drop the subframe out. It's not like any of this is particularly heavy, but you know, it's nice to do it in a sort of a controlled fashion. Yeah, that's loose, that's loose. That's how you separate those. Good. I left the wheels on it the whole time so that, well, I actually had to keep taking the wheels off and putting them back on. But that's so when I tipped it up on the opposite side, I wasn't pushing the brake assembly and everything and, and the bearings and everything into the grass here. I think it's me done for today. I think it's time to go inside and crack open a beer and think about what I've done. <laughs> yeah, just paint it. It was a good plan, but what are you going to do? I mean, the the front subframe, it's, it's cracked. It's, I don't know, is it dangerous? Well, yes, because if you, if you're riding this thing and the, that lets go, it's going to just, one of the front corners is going to dig into the ground and stop and you're going to go flying. Um, and it, it does maybe 20-25 miles an hour and you'll fly quite a long way and quite high. I know this because I was, when I was a teenager I was riding my bike one day and I had the, I had the lamp on the, on the front, on the, on the handlebars and it just fell off and it got, it got stuck in the spokes in the front wheel and I flew, yeah, a really long way and pretty high. And I flew so far that I had time to think when I was up in the air, thinking, oh, well, you know, this is kind of fun, but I'm going to land soon, and that's, that's really going to hurt. And, yeah, it, it did really hurt. And I, I had a bicycle helmet, obviously, because that's what you have when you're a kid when you're riding a bike. But it turns out that a bicycle helmet doesn't do anything when you land on your chin. So <laughs> I went chin first into the asphalt, and... Um, yeah, so it opened up a big hole. You could see inside. It was really weird and sort of kind of disgusting. So when I got that stitched up, um, still got a big scar there. You can't see it today because I've got a beard, but <laughs> the scar's still there. So, yeah, I, 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 I've done that once in my life. Um, I think once is enough. So I think it's probably a good idea to weld this thing up properly and maybe strengthen it up a little bit as well. So I don't go flying anymore. Welcome to the editing suite. It's come to my attention that this video is incredibly long. It's a, about an hour right now. As I get better and more used to making videos, well, I'll get better at not making videos that are ridiculously long. At the moment, this is where we're at. So, I'm going to break it here. So this is the end of part one. And we will continue part two. And there, there are five or six parts, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah, so see you next time.